slideshow. Let me start. So um, before I introduce Loren, I, I want to just think about where we are for a moment. We're here in this incredible auditorium in the Barrington Public Library, the library, which is a fantastic partner of ours. And Siobhan in the back, uh, Siobhan Egan kind of makes all this magic happen. And they provide this facility to us and partner with us on these projects. It's really amazing. Um, but where this library is situated is kind of interesting too, because it's, it's situated on this land in the town of Barrington that has a long and storied history. Uh, we know that people have lived here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We're sort of the latecomers to the party. And I wanna acknowledge the fact that these are the ancestral homelands of the Poconoka people, but also to acknowledge that um, these lands also have been home to indigenous peoples for many, many, many thousands of years and that the Narragansett people had many intersections with this area as well. And the Narragansett tribe is the only federally recognized tribe in Rhode Island. And so um, we're fortunate today that our speaker is an enrolled citizen in the Narragansett Tribal Nation. I, I wanna remind you um, that as we go about our day, um, we're often encountering people who have indigenous heritage. Um, and it is, it is, it's a privilege to work with people who bring that perspective to our lives. And if anyone here has any kind of indigenous heritage and you'd like to share that, please raise your hand. Um, I know, yes. And yes, you, yes, exactly, yeah. So that's right, that's right. So um, we really honor that and, um, and, and we'd like to take a moment to think about that uh, because it's a privilege for us to be on this land that has been um, the home to so many people. Um, so, so here today, I'm super honored to be introducing uh, my friend and former colleague, Lorraine Spears, who is the executive director of the Tomaquag Museum. She's an author, she's a teacher, she's a culture bearer, as I mentioned, she's a citizen of the Narragansett Tribal Nation. As executive director of the Tomaquag Museum, which is um, in historic Arcadia Village in Exeter, um, she is leading Rhode Island's only museum that is led and operated by indigenous people. When you look at the mission of the Tomaquag Museum, it's a long mission. I took a little tiny piece of it, which I thought really, really sums it up to educate the public and promote thoughtful dialogue regarding indigenous history, culture, arts, and mother earth, and to connect to native issues of today. In 2016, the Tomaquag was an Institute of Museum and Library Sciences national medal winner. And I can tell you that's no small achievement. It's a real rare kind of an honor. Lorraine and her team have given voice and power to indigenous peoples. She envisions a future where people engage in thoughtful dialogue and promote understanding of indigenous cultures and their interrelationship with the wider world. So it is my incredible honor to welcome Lorraine Spears. Loren, when you want to make the slides move just for sure. This one. Asawi Kwasin, Natasui Smakasini Pashao at Naha Gansik, Natasui Loren Spears at English at Ni Naha Gansik Nahantik. Uh, Kanupiam at Aki at Nahaigansik Ka Wampanoak. So, hello everyone. I'm Loren Spears, as you heard. My traditional name is Makasani Pashao, and I am Narragansett Niantic and an enrolled citizen of the Narragansett Nation. And um, welcome to the homelands of the Narragansett and Wampanoag peoples. So, how are you? Um, very excited to be here and hello to those on the Zoom. Um, so we're gonna spend, I guess, about 45 minutes sharing about indigenous plants from an indigenous perspective. Um, 
And so the, that uh, big long word there is, and, and, and can I get it out? Because some days I can and some days I can't. Uhe tie wawag. It's a lot of vowels in our language and you have to say all of them. And sometimes I leave some of them off to my mother's dismay. Um, but it's the word plants. Um, our language likes to have really big words. So chapachana anahatak means choker. <laughs> so it's like really long and in English this long. So plants um, and thinking about a Narragansett perspective. And I put that image of a plant because when I said my name, Makasani Pashao in Narragansett, it's that plant, which is an indigenous plant to this place. And so things that we have and um, our relationship with this ecosystem is connected to all Natangsawag, uh, all of our relations, plants, animals, um, the, the celestials, the stones, um, which we call the grandfather stones. So we, all of that we're in relationship with. Not going to go all the way there or I'll be totally off topic, but just to make sure, even though we're talking about plants, that we understand that things are all intersected and that they need one another because the plants need Nipaus, the sun, to grow. They need uh, uh, Sokanun, the rain, <laughs> and other waters to survive. They need uh, Nukasi, Nukasaki, the, the, the soil of the land, to, to flourish. And it needs humans' hands in some cases especially agricultural cases to help along as well, as well as plant life and animal life to make all of that work. So just to kind of, as we're talking about this, think about the intersectionality of all of those things. So as I was kind of already saying, thinking about, I can't decide to have my glasses on or off. Like to look at you, I need them off and to see what's on my screen, unless I stand back here a couple of feet. Um, I can't see them. <laughs> so, um, but luckily most of it I know anyway. So the idea of um, us and being in this space and place and our literal, literal relationship to this place um, and the cycles of life that are in here and our creation stories that place us in this space. And if I could live to be a thousand years old, I could know all the stories of everything. But in reality today, any one human only knows an apportionment of those stories, but just to know that all these gifts that are here are for our next generations, including this traditional ecological knowledge that I'm sharing with you that's been shared with me from people in my family and community. Um, I sort of start with 13 Thanksgivings, partly because they're often connected to plant life. Not all of them, but many of them. And so I wanted us to think about those traditional harvests and Thanksgivings, whether that be maple sugar Thanksgiving or sometimes today we reverse the, the technically the moon is the time period of that work. And the Thanksgiving is the, the giving thanks and the ceremony and the festivities for that time period. So, but today we kind of interchange. So there's the corn plant planting moon, um, strawberry Thanksgiving, the green bean Thanksgiving, all the summer Thanksgivings are of course done with the harvest from the sea, um, the green corn Thanksgiving and harvest, um, which today is the Narragansett August meeting powwow. And if you go to Mashantucket, it's their August powwow. If you go to Mohegan, it's their August powwow today. Powwows, really old ones in particular, stem from those traditional harvest Thanksgivings. Um, so cranberry Thanksgiving and so on. So you get the idea. I don't have to list them all, but it gives you that notion of that connection to the land and the cycles of the seasons. So that's really important for us to think about. And so I always like to, I don't know, start cyclically, I guess, and start in the spring a little bit. So Saquon, which is the word for spring in our language, and you see the intersection. So there's the harvesting of maple sap, which is what the elders doing here is cooking down some maple sap. I could have showed you a tree, but I figure you already all know what a tree looks like, especially a maple tree, right? Um, so you don't really need to see that per se, but you can look at the life ways of our people. If you think about it, maple, the reason it rose up to be this very important ceremony and harvesting time is think about our ancestors in this space and place living here for thousands upon thousands of years. We'll let the archaeologists and anthropologists argue about it, but we know it's well over 10 and closer to 15 and probably more like forever. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, 
our ancestors would spend that time harvesting because that time of the year, like, you know, it was renewal. It was like the new year, right? You're harvesting life that's coming back into the trees and you're harvesting that when a wakoni meat or the sweet water, which gives you lots of carbohydrates in the latter part of winter when there's less in your stores. Um, people like to envision we were starving to get death. We didn't live here for thousands upon thousands of years and starve to death. So we had very good strategies around um, harvesting and, and, and uh, storing and preserving and such. But you can imagine we all live in this region now. If we have a rough winter, which was not last winter, but about four years ago, maybe, or five years ago, um, we had that really bad winter where snow was like up to our knee and it was April. And if you can envision our ancestors living in this space, well, there's still snow on the ground and all of a sudden you're able to harvest this beautiful gift from the creator. So therefore you have extra thankfulness for that gift. On the left-hand side or my left, maybe you're right. No, nope, you're left still, um, is the um, uh, birch bark macaque. And so birch bark, the tree itself, um, I have some other things here with birch in them. Um, you can, of course, harvest the bark and that bark can make this beautiful container, which can store maple sap because it was very fancy. We were very amazing engineers because the way that that's made and the way it overlaps, it makes it watertight or liquid tight, if you will. So the um, macaque, but you also could make an amazing tool for moving from one place to another, like a birch bark canoe, um, to name just a couple of things. And if we're in the modern era, we can make a birch bark frame. Or if we really got fancy, because there's lots of people um, doing it with um, birch earrings and things like that, people use it as parchment. And if you come to our archives, you can see Princess Red Wing's birch bark business cards. Uh, that's what happens when you're born in 1896. <laughs> You, you get very creative. You don't have Vistaprint. Um, and then, you know, you can get medicines from the birch. Um, you can get this chaga, um, which is a wellness medicine. My father-in-law was very um, skilled at medicines. And um, this one, he very much used to uplift people's immunities that were battling very difficult diseases to help them uh, sustain themselves. And Chaga comes from the birch tree, but you also can use birch sap. We've all heard of sarsaparilla and birch beer and things like that. It comes from that, so it's edible. So lots of um, gifts that are there. Um, this is an obvious one. You get to eat the nuts for sure. It's medicinal, it's edible, it's used as tools. You can make things out of the wood. Um, um, the shagbok hickory um, is, if you haven't had it, it's a really delicious nut. Um, and we uh, have a good friend and his name is eluding me right now, but he made the best cookies with those. Um, so, you know, really good foods. Um, spring gatherings. I mentioned strawberry Thanksgiving already. If you don't know, it's this Saturday, not at our normal location, but at our partner location at URI on the quad. Because last year we had 350 people. And if you've been to Tomaquag, you know we're small. And we had terrible issues with parking. And so we decided we would do it at the quad this year. And so come join us. We've got about, I don't know, maybe a dozen artist vendors, lots of performances and storytelling and the like. But the event is to celebrate Witta Miniash, the heart berry. Um, and it's the gift of friendship. And my aunt actually wrote the book about that traditional story of the gift of friendship. But everything has its meanings, uh, philosophically, but it's also obviously edible and it gives you nutrients, lots of vitamin C and such. Um, but it's, it's an, oh, by the way, how many people like making smoothies? How many people leave the greens on their strawberries in their smoothies? Only one. <laughs> Throw the greens in your smoothies. You're losing the nutrients. So all good. So if you're making smoothies, throw the tops in. Um, fiddleheads, uh, you know, we have an elder uh, who's since passed on, uh, Donnie Hopkins, uh, I think it's traditionally in the Swift Eagle, if my memory is right, um, made the best fiddleheads. Like I'm waiting to grow up and become the person that can collect the fiddleheads right. Um, I always daydream and I'm like, oh, it's almost time. And then, oh, it went by. <laughs> so you, you've got to be efficient. Our ancestors were very efficient about 
identifying and collecting. There are lots of other ferns that are used for other kinds of medicinal purposes. Um, one of them that I've depicted here is sweet fern. Um, my own son learned about this particular fern from his grandfather when he was around um, maybe seven. Um, anybody know sweet fern? Just a couple. So sweet fern is really great for poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, those kinds of things. Um, and my son got like the worst weeping poison, I think it was oak if my memory is right, on his face. And of course he went to his, his grandparents' house with pink stuff on it, which was doing zero. And so his grandfather was like, hey boy, go find this. And he describes the sweet fern over the hill. My son went away, never came back. <laughs> and I got there to pick him up and my father-in-law's like, I thought he was never gonna come back. An hour later, my son comes back with a bunch and he's like, is this it, Pops? And he's like, yep. And my father-in-law, I don't recommend you do this, but my father-in-law took it, threw it in his mouth, chewed it up to activate the medicine, plopped it on his face, um, told him, leave it there for a little bit. When, and then told me, when you get home, steep it like a tea, do not drink it, dab it with cotton balls on the face, swear to you, not a lie, next day, no longer weeping, still red, but no longer weeping in less than 24 hours. Um, so now, like my son's 29, this was a long time ago, we haven't used the pink sun stuff since because it doesn't work. Um, so traditional medicines are really important in our communities and it's really important for it to be passed down to next generation. So it's important that my father-in-law shared it with his children and that his children, my husband, and, and, and you know, passing it along to the next generations. Um, I have my gifts. Medicines are ones I know much better after the last 30 years of my life than I did when I was younger. Um, a child, I was much more of a gatherer with plants and berries and things like that, which also have medicinal properties. So I mentioned planting moon below before, and I wanted to just kind of reinforce how many of you have heard of the three sisters? Yeah, it's a common thing people hear, especially when you go to land trust and you like plants and like being outside. But one of the things that I find is people mention the three sisters, the corn, the bean, the squash. And they usually stop the conversation there. I already gave you a hint earlier. You know, you have to have the sun. You have to have the water, the fresh water, whether it's the rain or the fresh water. But you also need the salt water. You need the salt water plants. And you need the salt water animals, the fish and the shells crushed up to give nutrients to your soil. You need the soil. You need the micro organisms that are in the soil. And in agriculture, you need the humans to help too. We all have a job to do. And so that interrelationship is wider than the three, although we talk to that a lot, you know, the corn being the big sister and the holding up the beans and the beans giving nutrients to the soil and the squash, the baby sister, but having the biggest leaves to hold in the moisture. But, you know, it's the interrelationship is bigger than that. And I think it's really important for us to always remember that we're all part of that interrelationship and we need to um, move that forward. And we also need to think about how these things are important to us. So maniash, um, which is corn, which I have some, some Narragansett flint corn here. Um, the thing is, we are talking about what things represent. So most people think about the corn and the only thing they think about is that you eat the corn. Um, and so I want you to stretch your thinking on really every plant, but we'll speak to this plant because it's a good example. It's a symbol of fertility, which is why the corn is not represented in this picture, but my son and his wife are represented in this picture um, because it's often used as a gift um, when people get married, symbolically and literally. Um, the symbolism is, uh, Tall Oak gave me a wedding knocker that was corn because it's a symbolic representation of the gift of fertility. Um, corn historically ensured the strength and a vitality of our communities. So when early colonists came and stole the caches and said God's divine provenance, you know, allowed it to just be laying there for them, they were actually hindering our health and wealth as a people. 
um, because the corn was so valuable to our community um, and made sure that we sustained the long winters. Um, so it was part of the wedding ceremonies, but it's also part of birthing ceremonies where the pollen, um, or sometimes people will actually do the ground corn today, of the corn is, is sprinkled with the child, but again, symbolically as representation of fertility of you individually, but really your people, your whole sustainable as a people. And so it's a great gift of the creator. And if you don't know our traditional story, if I start telling the whole thing, we will not get very far. Um, but the short version of it is the crow brought us the corn from the Southwest. And interestingly enough, archaeologists love that our traditional story, they've kind of proved archaeologically as well. And so um, the people sacrificed and, you know, and then the crow brought back the gift. So corn, just focusing on corn for a minute. There's the journey cakes or cornmeal cakes um, the, that most Rhode Islanders have had. Have you had Johnny cakes? Yeah, so you'd be amazed at how many rooms I go in and they like, no, never heard of that. Um, but I, I always ask, well, are you a Rhode Islander? And they're like, no, I moved here two years ago. <laughs> it doesn't count. Um, so there's no keg, which is the cornmeal that is kind of like if you eat the cornmeal as a parched cereal, you can even eat it dry. Um, Sakatash, which is a corn and bean dish, of course, corn chowder, uh, corn soup, which is with the harmony corn, um, which is considered different. Um, and there's a whole complicated way of making that. So it's just giving you a little bit of ideas of traditional food ways. Um, ooh. Yeah. So back to plants in another way. Um, our plants are important because we needed them historically to build our homes. Um, there was a law, and we're kind of on the East Bay. So there was a law on Aquidneck Island during colonial times where it was against the law for indigenous people to harvest bark. You know, when I talk to young people and you are all land trust folks, so I'm gonna say this point to you as well. They think of it from a modern day conservation mindset. Oh, well, if you strip the bark, then you kill the tree. And that's usually the number one answer I get. When you make a law like that, you strip us of every life way we have. Can't build our homes, can't make a canoe, can't make um, a bark basket, can't do a myriad of things as far as things for your home and travel and so forth. But also you can't get your medicines, you can't get your foods. Um, the list goes on. There's so many things that cordage and other things that are interrupted from that. So it's really important to think about those sort of colonial laws and how they impacted our life ways. But in our traditions, our homes are covered in bark. Poplar was a, a very important cover, but there was a variety of woods that could be used. Um, uh, with poplar bark, you could not only cover your homes, but you could make the quiver for your arrows. You could get cordage from underneath from the inner bark. You could get medicines for toothaches from chewing on that. You could do so much just with the bark. And of course you could use the big leaves as a poultice. It's, it's amazing what you could do. And so our ancestors did all these things. And today, this is not from 400 years ago, my brother-in-law Cassius, my two sons, Robin and Ridge, and my two nephews, Kyle and, and, and uh, Cassius Jr., they made this Nusquito. Um, and they did it because we make them today for cultural competency within our own communities, for ceremony. And this particular one, it was for a wedding pre-ceremony, kind of like the rehearsal dinner kind of thing. Um, but it was a pre-ceremony. Um, and, and we also do it for educational purposes for other people. So here's a, a Witu, um, or sometimes you hear it as a wigwam with Princess Red Wing um, from the early days of Tomaquag Museum. And what she's making on that is cattail mats. Well, the cattails um, are not just good for mats. They're good for eating. Anybody had cattail before? Well, that's a couple of people, more than in most rooms, there was like four. Um, it's very tasty. Right, so you should have some cattails. Um, so, but you could also line your baby's cradle board with that top. Um, you could, of course, eat the shoots and 
preferably the tender young ones, not the old hard ones. You can, of course, make this gorgeous mat just to name a few things that you could do with the cattail. Um, the bulrush, most people see this in, in the freshwater areas, um, sometimes the saltwater estuaries. Um, bulrush, it's usually in the water and it looks like a burst of grass, right? And people don't realize that it has such benefits. One of the biggest benefits is this beautiful um, interior mat. The other cattail was exterior, bulrush was interior on your home. Um, but you can eat the seeds, you can eat the roots, the shoots, um, you can eat the pollen. There's all kinds of things and resources that you can eat. And so as we continue on, because I'm probably gonna have to pick up a little speed because I tend to tell little stories and take too long. Um, this, you know, we're collecting herbs and medicines, roots and tubers, um, um, you know, for edible, medicinal, useful purposes. And this is an example of a white um, pine basket. You can also use pine needles, um, one for tea as a medicinal and just like a wellness tea because there's levels of medicine. So mint tea, ginger tea, those kinds of things. We consider those wellness, no matter how much you drink of it, it might help you in having a bellyache, but it's not gonna kill you if you drink a gallon of it. So then, then there's another level where things get a little more tricky. And it's like, if you do too much of it, it could be harmful. And then there's stuff that you only can take if you're really guided by someone who is in that med medicinal knowledge that knows how to do it. Because if you ingest it the wrong way, you're going to die kind of thing, right? So we try to look at those things from that vantage point. Um, ground nuts. At Tomahawk, we actually have some ground nuts. Um, it is one of our, one of my missions to actually eat some, but we always see them in the spring when the flowers are up and then we lose track of where they are in the mire that they're in um, to find them later. Um, so this year we're gonna try a tie a bow on them when the flowers come out because where they're at, it's just wildness. Um, so, but you can eat the tuber, the flower, the seeds. Um, you do have to be careful and know how to process some of these things because sometimes they have to be, um, cooked extra long in order to be, be um, uh, good for you. It's kind of like um, milkweed. Milkweed and the pods, they're edible, but sometimes you have to know what you're doing to be to eat them. They actually taste really good. Anybody eaten milkweed pods? So they're really good. <laughs> I really enjoyed those. Someone, the ones that I had most recently, they were kind of pickled. So they kind of looked like gherkins, but they were the milkweed pod. They were very tasty. Um, so there's, of course, here in our ecosystem, there's um, all kinds of berries, which give you all kinds of nutrients and vitamin C. And, you know, of course, a lot of them, you can use the leaves as um, teas and things like that and medicinal properties. And in this picture here, I've got the sassafras. Most of you, I'm talking to the kind of room that knows what sassafras, most people here know what sassafras looks like, right? But I did put the picture so you, people can see there's the different leaf configurations, which helps you find it. Um, but this is the sassafras root for us to make sassafras tea. And this moment is making me think of um, Sherry Pocknett, who owns Sly Fox Den um, and who is an, a chef, um, by the way, that just won the James Beard Award. Um, so awesome. And she makes delicious sassafras tea. So if you've never had sassafras tea and you're like, hey, I'd like to try that, you can just mosey to Charlestown. I know you need to pack a bag, but I did make it here and I live in Charlestown. So hopefully I make it home tonight. <laughs> so, oh, I already talked about milkweed, got ahead of myself, but there's a beautiful milkweed plant. Um, not, I think what's nice to think about is that not only is it a gorgeous pollinator, <laughs> but it is also edible. And if you know what you're doing, you could be um, eating that uh, food. So throughout the seasons, there's all kinds of resources that you can get and that you want to have that is um, connected to plants because most of these resources um, are coming from plant fibers or wood to make those things, whether that's your fishing tools or gardening tools, 
um, and your resources for that. So the nets out of milkweed and dog bane to just name a couple of things. So here's a picture of dog bane and here's an amazing dog bane basket, but it shows the cordage. We had um, uh, Julia Martin, who's an Aquina Wampanoag uh, artist who is an amazing twiner. And this is a twined bag um, that if you come to Tomacog Museum, you can see some of her pieces in the collection. Um, I've done twining on and off. I'm still a novice because I've done it more off than on over the course of my life, um, relatives and family members that have done it. But what was really interesting is when um, you see someone who has the capacity to process traditional materials, make the cordage, and then weave the piece. I'm actually a weaver and I can't do all of that. Um, so it's on the bucket list when I retire from being the executive director of Plum Quag Museum. Um, I can spend time harvesting plants and trans turning them into cordage. Um, we have over here, I mean, I'll just bring it closer to and show you. This is um, milkweed, obviously the pod, but this is the fiber that you can get from inside the milkweed. And this is the cordage that can be made from that fiber to make cordage that then you would weave into that basket. Now this basket is dog bane, but it's the same process. And instead of being dog bane, it would be milkweed. So I just wanted to kind of show you like a little bit of that process because it's very difficult. People don't realize how difficult it is and why um, artists in the 21st century, like myself, will cheat <laughs> and use cordage that's already been made. Uh, it still takes a lot of time and effort to make the final product, but you've skipped a bunch of steps. And so that's really important. Here's an example of nettle. You can of course have nettle tea. How many people have had nettle tea? Oh, that was a decent amount. I, I, I don't know. Thumbs up if you think it tastes like asparagus, thumbs up, thumbs down if you think it tastes like spinach. Because it's kind of a, a, a weird, it's like a taste. I think it tastes like asparagus, but other people are like, nope, it's spinach. So, <laughs> but it, it has a great taste. It's very tasty and, um, and, and good for you, very good for you. But you can also make your cordage out of nettle. Um, here's some samples of tools. This is a fishing weir. Um, of course, we have stone tools in there, but they often are attached to wood and cordage that is made from plant materials. Um, it, the fishing weir is for, it's a, sometimes called a basket trap, but that's a misnomer. It's for when fish are spawning upstream in brooks and smaller river um, estuaries and things like that. And when, just think of like the herring, you know, it's to slow them down because the back end, if you see the front part of this, it's open. It's not that we broke it or that it was ruined. It never was closed because it's meant for them to go through. And then that just slows them down enough for you to spear them, catch them, net them, et cetera. Here's some other technologies. Um, and here's back to intersection, how one thing is connected to another. So this deer shoulder hoe, of course, has a wooden handle, but it has a deer shoulder hoe. Um, there's uh, also... Um, other tools that are used like a mortar and pestle that are used for the grinding of foods and medicines and things like that. And, um, and then in the middle, it's a seed pot. Um, you make a clay pot and it's got a very little hole. It's a storage vessel for your seeds. Cause you know, today we collect heritage seeds. Historically, they always made sure they had their seed for the next season, the next generation already talked a lot about gardening, so I'm not gonna go back to that, but I will mention our amazing gourds. So here's a gourd rattle. And this is an amazing gourd bowl by um, uh, RJ Steppenwolf, who's a Mohegan artist. And inside it, I actually have uh, raw tobacco um, as part of uh, sacred plants for spirituality. Um, in here, we also have a picture of a uh, corn husk mat, corn husk doll on the table. So back to what else you can use the materials for, um, just to name a few. Um, we do obviously lots of cooking with all these plant materials um, and foods. There's lots of drying, um, smoking uh, of things. And, and when I say the smoking, because this is the intersection again, because you're using the different kinds of wood so that the smoking is a certain way. Um, 
my son dries a lot of meats, fish and venison and things like that. And, you know, sometimes he'll use maple and sometimes he'll use hickory. And it has a completely different taste when you get the end product based on the smoke um, that's there. Um, so I, I love, again, I'm talking to a choir room. How many people have eaten rose hips? See, that's what happens when you're at a land trust. I can assure you, most rooms I go to, they're like, I didn't know you could eat those. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and, you know, even my own children and, and other native young children, they're just so used to those kinds of things. Silver Moon makes a wonderful rose hip tea. Um, and there's one of uh, my aunts makes a rose hip jam or jelly that I like to use on roasts. You know how like sometimes you put a roast glaze? Very nice, very nice. Um, these are um, wild blueberries. Um, oops, decolonize my mouth, native blueberries. Um, I'm trying not to use the word wild anymore. I'll pass that along to the land trust folks. I've decided that that was put into place during colonial times because it was wild plants, wild Indians, wild animals, all free for the taking because they were all wild. And so I'm throwing that word away. Um, so I need to change my PowerPoint because it says it. <laughs> native blueberries um and so the the johnny cakes are there that was actually from a summer camp we did with tek which is traditional ecological knowledge which is what i'm talking about as we're talking today but with native youth and so they were making the johnny cakes and they had harvested the native blueberries and so forth so it's really important for them to do that and of course there's peas that you can make with that and of course a lot of vitamins and nutrients in those traditional foods um, here is um, some of the sacred um, materials. Like I mentioned, the, the tobacco that was there that's used in ceremony. But I also, um, the, in here is also, I'm smelling uh, just being harvested sweetgrass. And this is actually sweetgrass from our sweetgrass bed at the museum. And then in this basket, it's a corn husk and sweet sweetgrass coiled basket. And so it just shows you the, the materials and the resources that you can use. But sweetgrass, along with being used in making things, it's used in ceremony. Um, it's considered sacred. Um, the tobacco is considered sacred. It sends prayers to the creators. It has protective qualities. Cedar is another one of those materials that are considered sacred and have um, ceremonial spiritual qualities as well as um, medicinal and edible qualities to them. And so all of those things are really important. Um, there's another one, um, why is my brain not coming to it? It's a yellow plant that's kind of in the late summer. Goldenrod, thank you, goldenrod, yes. Um, that was often used in um, sweat lodge ceremonies and you would put it in the steam. And so then that would permeate the space as a ceremonial herb. Um, another thing that was done um, during ceremony, like um, during sweat lodge is also to feed you something like a strawberry. So not a bowl of them, but a strawberry that you could smell, you could feel, you could taste. And that helps you to um, be able to go through the process. Cause sometimes, you know, whenever you're uncomfortable, if you get focused on being uncomfortable for a moment, then you can't get past that. And so those were strategies elders have used um, to do that. And then today sage is traded as a ceremonial herb, sending prayers to the creator. Um, and that's, you know, my other daughter-in-law is Paiute Shoshone, and that like just grows everywhere there. Here, it's not something that grows regularly. Um, and we can introduce it, but traditionally it's not native to the space. Although there is a native sage, it's just not that sage. It's a different kind of thing. Um, so that's really important. And that drum, the drums are made of plants. This is a water drum. It's connecting the water that goes inside. It's connecting animal and plant and water because the, the drum itself is made out of wood. The water goes inside and then the hide is on the outside. So all of those things. Um, the calumet is connected to, um, to wood as well because a pipe stem is wood. Um, these are actually soapstone heads for the pipe and the dance that's being represented in the green corn harvest 
Thanksgiving or the annual August meeting powwow is um, the Calumet. And so um, I'm gonna zoom along a little bit here because some of these things I've already mentioned, so I'm not gonna mention them again, but it's nothing like seeing a cute little baby. <laughs> so here's harvesting in the fall, thinking about that's my son who's now 27. Um, we've got um, uh, the plant behind it is the Jerusalem artichokes and you can eat those of course. Um, there's the mushrooms in front. Um, in our family, we probably average about a dozen mushrooms that we eat, um, you know, besides the two that are depicted here, you know, um, the puffer mushroom, beef steak, uh, um, black trumpet, which I don't like. Um, I, I'm, I'm funny. I only like the firm ones. Anything that gets a little slimy, I'm not a fan. There's so many. I can't remember them all off the top of my head. Um, but some of them also, you have, if you're a mushroom or are you thinking about being a mushroom person? Make sure you go with someone who knows because some of the mushrooms, like some of the caps, you have to look at the spores and know which one's the right one. And some things you can only eat within a half an hour of having picked them. It's like all kinds of rules. So you need to know. But in our community, we have lots of people who harvest them. Um, the black walnut, um, we have a beautiful black walnut in our yard at the museum. Um, and it's great dye in our museum collection. We're really known for the basket stamping and the, the black, the dye from that is perfect for it. Although there's dye from oak trees and a myriad of others. Um, so those are really great. Um, other foods, chestnuts, acorns. Um, anybody eating any acorns? Oh, see, I love a room full of naturalists <laughs> because aren't they delicious? And you can eat them here even. You just have to do a little work. You know, you have to be like the little red, red hen and do a little work. You got to harvest them all. It's great if you've got kids with you. Harvest them all, put them in a sack, and run them through water. Particularly, we did it through the brook, a running thing that can wash out some of that tannic acid. You could soak them too and just keep soaking them over and over again. But that's not as fun as throwing them in the brook. Um, and then, you know, of course, dry them, ground them. Um, we did, we pretended we were going to do it with mortar and pestle for about five minutes. And then we threw them in the Cuisinart and just, <laughs> you know, it is the 21st century, right? <laughs> and we don't have hours and hours. So, <clears throat> of course, there's the grapes and the grapevine. You can get purplish gray dye from Obviously the grapes, you can eat the grape leaf and the grape vine, not the vines. The vines you can make baskets out of. We've got a beautiful grapevine basket. <clears throat> How many people go on cranberry picking? Not in Cape Cod. <laughs> ocean spray. <laughs> Just a few then. Anybody went to Cape Cod at Ocean Spray? <laughs> not that many more. So um, it's just that it doesn't look the same. Um, what they show you on TV and how they have their bogs isn't like the natural environment. So in Rhode Island, there are several places, and I'm sure there's some in this neck of the woods where you can harvest um, natural cranberries, native cranberries. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. She knew I was trying to stop my mouth. Um, and they're very, this is a picture of native cranberries. And uh, uh, they were originally just, you know, first off, they're not as round as ocean spray, just FYI, they're more oval. Um, than round naturally, but they're great for dyeing because the skins are so bright. Um, they're very helpful and nutrient filled for you. And certainly they, as we all know, because of craisins, they dry beautifully. Um, and they're really full of vitamin C, you know, and that's what helped us through the winters. Um, things like rose hips and cranberries made sure we had the, the vitamin C so we didn't get scurvies or any of those kinds of things during the winter because you plop cranberries in your soups and stews. Anybody do that? Cause it, it's delicious in like a stew, like a beef stew or a venison stew or, or a snapping turtle stew is really good. It's like, it's like a little bit sweet, but it has a little bit of an undertone of tart underneath it. It's really nice. Um, so lots of things there. Um, the basket I'm holding was actually made by kids in New Ichiwan school a few years back. Um, and it's a corn washing basket. That Ashland basket is one that I made. Um, this one, the kids made with an, an elder who was demonstrating. Um, and then, you know, of course, every season there's something to harvest. Um, there's these lovely things in the winterberry, but it also shows the technologies that you use during winter, like the snowshoe needs wood and plants. Um, you know, um, when you're hunting, you have tools for that. When you're ice fishing, you have tools for that, that often 
have some component of plants in them. And then games, games like the kids are playing snow snake. Historically, you carved your own snake and you shuttle it down the, the trowel that's been made. It's a great game for teachers, by the way, because you can uh, do uh, 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 speed, distance, velocity with the game, right? So um, that was a lot of fun. But so there's all these things that are made from the plant life that we're talking about. So you're always thinking about what's edible, what's medicinal, what's spiritual, and what's useful or technological. In, in your community. Um, everything is connected, which we talked about at the beginning, so I won't go into that in depth in that it's all important to us. Um, just the last couple of thoughts. I wanted to circle back to food sovereignty and the right to access and harvest these materials is an inherent right for indigenous people. So all of you that are working at a land trust, when you're partnering with indigenous people, you should think about harvesting access. A lot of times in land trust, we think in a modern world of preservation, but our elders and ancestors have always told us, you have to harvest to maintain. And so there has to be balance, so that's living in balance. So as you're protecting, think about how you can introduce strategies to allow harvest. Um, and what does that look like for your organization? So you can think about that and particularly and thinking about that for indigenous people for things that are harder to come by that are part of their culture and tradition to do, but maybe as the urban sprawl, even of, of uh, Barrington, you know, as it gets more and more, it's sometimes harder and harder to find those resources. So would it hurt to be able to allow people to harvest mushrooms at their own risk? Um, you know, would it hurt to allow them to harvest certain things and thinking about making a plan for that in the future so that you know what that is so that you can know that you're, you know, doing that in a good way. And then um, just lastly, we are the earth, what we do the, to the earth, we do to ourselves. It's just a teaching that has always been. And as we're thinking about um, this space and place that we live on, Nukasaki, Mother Earth, um, that we just keep that in our minds and think about how we can positively impact that. And I think, you know, land trusts, their, their intent is always to do so. So that's, you're already halfway there. Um, and now you just have to think about how can, um, not only can we protect it, but how can it be used in a, a proactive, sustainable way so that people, all people, um, have access, but in particular types of harvests, indigenous people have access. So Katabatosh, and I want to give you a chance to ask me a question or two. I know someone sent me some, but I will see if anybody has a question. Thank you. <laughs> if you have a question, um, just sing it out. Because I yes. Think we're gonna not we're not going to bring up, we'll repeat the question. There was someone that did send in a question. Let's see. What is something that you think is important for Native Americans to carry on their knowledge and traditions across the country? Hmm. Everything. Um, you know, it's, and, and I guess I'm going to break that down and go, each nation is an individual nation. Our cultures and traditions are completely different. My daughter-in-law, who's Paiute Shoshone, the thing that we have in common is that we're indigenous and conquest and colonization, right? And land dispossession and all of those things, right? Our life ways are extremely different. She's from the desert. I'm an Eastern Woodland Coastal. You know, it's very, very different. And so our, our stories and our histories and our oral history is different. Our life ways um, are different. And so I would say the thing that we're, as every indigenous community is trying to do is to continue to pass them forward. I feel really blessed that I get to work at a place called Tomaquag Museum. Um, I kind of grew up in it when it was just a volunteer run organization. And as a kid, you don't realize how important that was because that organization, along with things that were happening at, in, our, in other places within our tribal community was continuing tradition, continuing language, continuing ceremony, continuing, um, you know, traditional knowledge. 
um, across the board, right? Arts, what we call it today, but ecological knowledge, that was all continuing. And I think we're still continuing it. I'm a grandmother now. My grandson, um, Minakisu Mikwin, is five. Um, thinks he's 15, I think. Um, but he's five and he's going to head off to kindergarten, but he's going to have long hair and he still does have long hair. And, you know, that's a difficulty because the modern day norm or the Western norm is boys have short hair. My boys, which I have two of them, all had long hair. And they all had to go through the struggle of Western ways of thinking about hair and being called a girl when you're five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 20. Um, you know, I literally, my son, one of my sons has a full on beard and someone called him like, thought he was a girl. I'm like, there's nothing girl about him, but whatever. Um, but you know, it's, it's that tradition, that's culture to us. It's ceremonial to us. It's important to us. And there's so much more to that, but you know, there's a lot of things that are indigenous ideologies and understanding of the world. That's completely opposite to Western ideologies and views of the world. That's what we want to keep going. We don't want to lose that. And we keep fighting to lose, to keep that. And we also are keep fighting for sovereignty and rights. And I think there's the communal rights as indigenous nations, but there's also the independent right as an indigenous person to have access to hunting, fishing, gathering, you know, agriculture, saltwater access. I mean, we're constantly fighting for saltwater access. We're Eastern Woodland coastal people. We had nothing but we, we were the ones with the summer homes at the beach, you know, and, and it's, it's a challenge today. It's more and more restrictive. And so as um, entities create new things on the surface, they can sound really good. Like I've been talking to political leaders about this. It's great that you're doing um, aqua, aquaculture, like um, oyster farming in the salt ponds, but you're starting to restrict. Like we sat with DEM about this last year because they keep putting up boulders, keep blocking the access, and it's getting more and more. Every year we have to fight to continue to have access to go claw hogging, to go oystering, to go scalloping, to go clamming, to do every, and the clams are very poor these days compared to before, to go crabbing, you know, all of those things. Um, and each generation we're getting dispossessed of our rights, our inherent rights as indigenous people on this place. So that's what I would say would go with that. Anyone else have a question that's in the room? Yes. Kind of feedback like that, but is there a way to be on like a Western bill that are coming up that would help that would be able to vote one man or email mm -hmm. uh, senators? Uh, I don't know if there is. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if there is a listserv of that sort, um, but something to think about as people are getting, you know, it's tricky. Like my job is education, so I'm always educating. Although under our indigenous empowerment, sometimes we do talk to politicians and try to get some legislation moving, um, but it's not our main focus to do the legislation of that. Um, I, I just like to get in the room and educate all of you so that you <laughs> can have at least a little more knowledge or at least know where to go call and ask a question. Um, one more second, because I was just trying to see if I had one more answer to that. Um, sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's usually more on the federal level than the, like across the board versus local. Um, the cherry fix is the one that you should all vote for because um, you know we're constantly being stripped of our rights. Um, that should be done. Um, the, you know, on a local level. You could think about who is your indigenous population that's living in your town? Do they have access to hunting and fishing in any kind of way? Or is there always barriers to that? Um, I keep doing this to every politician that will listen. In my opinion, if you're indigenous um, and, you, and if you have to start somewhere, start with federally or officially state recognized tribes. Um, and their tribal ID, which is a federal ID, um, if you're a federally recognized tribe, should be able to be your hunting and fishing and gathering 
license. Like it's absurd that we should have to pay to hunt or fish or gather in our own space. Um, so I just keep pushing for that. And, you know, it took a long time to get the name changed for our state. Um, when it failed like 12 years ago, every time I was in any room like this, I just kept blabbing about it. But a lot of other people were blabbing about it too. And all of a sudden the swell came and change happened. Um, so I think that's important. Mm -hmm. You have a question? No. Yes. I'm wondering, Lauren, if you could tell us um, anything about your plans for the future. Sure. Um, the short version is um, we have plans um, to move to um, land that's been, um, we made an agreement with the University of Rhode Island for 18 acres of land um, uh, in Kingston. And so soon, and that's relative, <laughs> soon we'll be moving to Kingston. First, we have to break ground, which is supposed to be next spring. Um, we've just finished the architectural and engineering plans for um, uh, the uh, um, first three buildings, a main museum building um, with the museum store and an entry gallery. The second building is the Indigenous Empowerment Center, which has the, uh, the first one had the education team offices. The second one has the Indigenous Empowerment Team offices for interns and fellows and things like that, has the artist in residency studio and a workshop classroom space. And the cafe, which won't be called the cafe, but it'll have um, foods that people can come and have indigenous foods um, that fit the seasons throughout the year. Um, and then um, the education center, which is for workshops, classes, things like this. And um, the last building, which is phase two, is the archive collections research center, which will house the archives. The collections have an entry exhibit as well. Um, the cafe between the cafe and the artist and residency studio has a built-in exhibit as well. So we're trying to make the whole campus have um, things for you to do and be part of and experience. And um, all the administration offices will be sort of on the backside of that fourth building. We haven't designed that one. So in my head, it's on the backside. Um, and uh, that will have the marketing and media uh, you know, center and um, all the administration all the people that do that fun work. <laughs> yes. We are in Exeter. We are in Exeter, um, in Arcadia. And I have flyers up here if you want to take one. Um, you're welcome to at the end. So we've been in Exeter since 1970. We were founded in 1958. Um, and so um, we have been around for a long time. However, we were always volunteer when I heard your board meeting and you were talking about having your first staff person. Um, we had like people over the years that maybe got a little as the early days with Eva Butler and Red Wing used to call it pin money. So like during the season, you got a little pin money. Um, but I'm technically our first official staff um, that um, came on. And now we have 14 um, staff, uh, eight full time and six part time. And uh, between now and opening the museum, we're supposed to get to 24. <laughs> so we shall, you know, of course, some of them will be seasonal, like summer educators and, and things of that nature. But like right now, we don't have a cafe, so we have no cafe staff. Like you gotta have staff. And, and even now, we don't, we, we don't have admission staff. We only have either the educator or the person that's doing the museum store that covers that. And in the future, we need that. So just as an example of spaces. So yeah, um, we do have on our website, there There are some pictures there. So it's minimal right now. We are working on the like campaign website behind the scenes, which will probably launch at the same time as we put the first shovel to the ground next spring. Uh, Cause according to our campaign manager, that's how you do things. Um, and so we've been raising quietly, raising money um, to get to that point. So um, our lift is big. Um, and I think the overall lift is like 14 million, uh, to get the shovel to the ground. Our goal is six and we're at 4.5. You didn't hear that from me. <laughs> no. So we're getting there. We're slowly getting there. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun to dream the future, um, and see what you can do. And my ultimate goal with everything is what can we do for the next generations that come? And so that's what we're trying to do is make this sustainable, 
um, even though we're 60 plus years old, where we weren't sustainable for most of those, even though we, we did it, but we weren't. Um, and so we've been working really hard to build that infrastructure to our organization. And I will tell you something that's really new. It was in the news this week. Um, today's Tuesday, no, when, maybe it was last week, I can't remember. But we're one of the groups that got the um, endowed fund from the Rhode Island Foundation. So talking about sustainability, once you start heading into endowed funds, that starts to lead you to long-term sustainability. So we're really grateful. Speaking my language, yeah. Laura. <laughs> it is true. Yeah. Uh, Loren, I am so grateful that you came such a long distance to be with <laughs> us. And in, in return, we will all go and see you, right? Yeah. And if anybody has a question, they can come up and chat with me up here as we're absolutely. And we have we have our uh, goodies in the gallery, so we can continue the conversation there. And thank you all so much for coming and for being a part of this event. And if Maddie is here, she can come down and I'll answer her question because it was very specific. Um, Maddie's facts. Maddie's facts. I don't think she's here. She's not here. No. Okay. Well, she can email me. There you go. Perfect.